Well, good morning. How is everyone? Great. Well, if you have your Bible, go ahead and open to Genesis chapter 2. That's where we're going to be this morning, or at least where we'll be starting out. We'll kind of be jumping around a little bit. Uh, but if you don't know me, my name's Chase Jones. I'm the Connections Pastor here at the Hanley Campus. There we go. <laughs> um, but I have the fun task this morning of answering the question, what do men want women to know? So uh, no pressure, right? It's not like I kind of feel like I'm speaking on behalf of 50% of the world's population, but, but, <laughs> but it's all right. Uh, like Bernard said earlier, we're in the second week of our series called It's Complicated. And what we're doing is we're taking a, a deep look at relationships and what the Bible has to say about different relationships. And so if you were here last week, uh, Jared answered the question, what do women want men to know? And then today I'm going the other way with that question. So ladies, this, series, or this sermon this week is primarily aimed at you guys. Uh, in the same way that last week was aimed at the men. All right, and I, I would say that Jared kind of gave me this one because he didn't want to go anywhere near this topic. Uh, but actually, he's actually preaching at Green Oaks today uh, on the same topic. So let's hope uh, the ladies over there give him some grace, and we'll see if either of us has a job tomorrow. Right? No, I'm just joking. Uh, in all seriousness, I really am excited to be up here. And, and let me just start by saying this. Uh, my job when I'm up here, and primarily Jared's job, but my job in his, off, in his absence, or uh, anyone else who's preaching, all the pastors, all the communicators at Rush Creek, our job is not to stand up here and give you our opinion on how the world works. All right, our job is not to stand up here and say, this is how we think the world should work. Our job is to take the truths of scripture and communicate those so that we can all live the way that God wants us to live. Right? And so the reason why I think that's important to start out with that this morning is because it's inevitable that when we get to these controversial topics, when we, when we talk about these things that are hot-button issues in our, in our society, like gender and family roles, all those things, it's inevitable that some disagreement might arise. It's inevitable that some things might challenge us. And I know for a fact I was challenged by the sermon last week in a good way. And so if we're feeling that way this morning, if something's said and you, and you think, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't sit right, uh, what you need to do is you need to, real, you need to uh, figure out if it aligns with what the Bible says. Right? Because if I say something and it aligns with what the Bible says and you don't like it, well, then you're going to have to, you're gonna have to deal with that, that disagreement there. But if I say something and the Bible doesn't say it, then you have a genuine right to be upset, right? I don't know if you knew this, but the Bible says uh, it's better for me to tie a big rock around my neck and jump in the ocean than to teach the Bible the wrong way. So, um, so let's, just, let's just keep that in mind as we're going through this, because if we're going to call ourselves Christians and followers of Christ, uh, we're going to have to wrestle with some of the, some of the difficult texts. And so, so that's what we're going to do starting in Genesis chapter 2. And so we're going to start Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Um, and if you don't have a Bible, the words are on the screen. Uh, but after the service, go back to the next steps table, and you can get a Bible. That's our gift to you this morning. Um, but for now, you can follow along on the screen. So Genesis 2, starting in verse 18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper as his complement. So the Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky and brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, and to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found as his complement. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. All right, so what we have there, what we just read, is the first surgery ever performed, right? I'm reminded of a story of a, a, a young boy in Sunday school who was taught what we just read, and he, he went home, and throughout the week he wasn't feeling too well, and his mom came in, and he was kind of hunched over, and she said, what's wrong? He said, I think I'm having a wife. <laughs> right, but no, no, this is just a one-time supernatural event uh, in which God saw that something wasn't right in the world as it was and stepped in and made it even better, Right? And so the reason why we looked at Genesis 2 is because before we answer the question, what do men want women to know, we need to figure out why it even matters. 
Why should you care what men want women to know? All right, and so there's just a few things I want to pull from this passage here. The first thing is that the world was not complete without women. The world was not complete without women. All the men said? Amen. <laughs> there you go. So this right there should shatter any notion of misogyny and sexism within the church, right? This should shatter all that. The Bible is not misogynistic. It's been misused in the past, but it's not misogynistic. And men, let me talk to you for a second. If you or I ever use the word of God to belittle the creation of God, then we're going to have to stand before God one day and give an account for why we did that. All right? So don't do that. Uh, the second thing that we need to talk about is the word helper. The word helper. It says that God made Eve to be a helper for Adam. Now, the word helper in Hebrew is the word ezer. It's the word ezer. And what's interesting about this word is it's used in most situations in the Bible to actually talk about God himself. God is our helper. He's our ezer. Let me give a couple examples here. Uh, Psalm 121, 1 through 2, it says, I lift my eyes towards the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help, my ezer, comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Exodus 18, 4, the God of my father was my helper and delivered me from Pharaoh's sword. And then one more, we can go to several of them, but just one more here. Psalm 33, verse 20, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. So if God's the one who's being called helper, then the word helper cannot mean lesser, right? In, in fact, usually when someone needs a helper, it's because they're not strong enough on their own to get the task done on their own. So like if I'm lifting, which I haven't done in far too long, I was kind of out of breath running up these stairs here, uh, but, but if, I'm, if I'm lifting and I need a spot, it's because I'm not strong enough to, get that, uh, to, to lift that weight all by myself, right? Or God, um, he's our helper, it's because we're not strong enough on our own to fulfill the responsibility that, he, that he's tasked us with, right? So the word helper cannot mean lesser. However, the word helper, both in Bible times and in today, and today has always been used talking about um, helping someone who has some sort of primary responsibility. All right, you see what I'm saying? So if you're helping someone, they're the ones that are tasked with that primary responsibility, but that doesn't make you lesser than that person. I don't know if you knew this, but Will Griswold, he puts together the order of the sermon and the songs and all of that every single week. And I think he's doing a, doing a great job. He puts together who's you know, doing the welcome, who's doing the, the, the announcements at the end, all of that. So if Will calls me up one day and he says, hey, I need help trying to figure out something in this sermon, I'm his helper, but he's still the one who's tasked with the primary responsibility. You see what I'm saying? God, who's our helper, it's still our responsibility to live according to God's word. Just because he's helping us, it doesn't make it his responsibility. All right, now what we talked about last week, the man in the relationship is tasked with leading in that relationship. That's their primary responsibility. And so woman was created to come alongside man, not behind him, not in front of him, but come alongside him so that he can fulfill that God-given task. All right, so um, we'll come back to that in a second, but uh, the last thing I want to pull from this passage in Genesis is that it says, uh, that, that phrase, as his complement. God made Eve as Adam's complement, or some translations say a helper fit for Adam. Now, what does that mean? Well, that again points to a distinction between men and women, but it doesn't lessen the value of men and women. So, um, anyone like baseball? Any baseball fans? All right, any baseball players? All right. We might need you for our church softball team uh, coming up in, a couple, in about a month, so, so talk to me later. <laughs> um, but... When you're playing baseball, was that bad? Am I supposed to, like, recruit for softball in the middle of the sermon? <laughs> I feel like I stepped out of bounds there. So, let me... <laughs> um, so if, if you're watching or if you're playing baseball, what's more important, the bat or the ball? Neither, right? They both, they're different. They, they serve different roles. They have different functions. But without a bat, you're just playing catch. And without a ball, you're just working on your swing. You can't play baseball without the bat and the ball. They come together to serve a purpose. Or if you, if you don't like sports and you like to, you know, write letters or something, um, what's more important? I feel like I said that like it's bad, like it's worse than baseball. <laughs> but if you like to write letters, what, what's more important? The pen or what you're writing on, right? They both serve functions together um, to accomplish a goal. And so in the same way with relationships, 
Men and women were created differently. That's why it's important as a church to maintain that distinction between men and female. Uh, but men and women were created to serve different functions so that they can work together to serve a common goal. All right? So the reason I, I brought all that up is because uh, if woman is a helper for man to, co- to, uh, to lead within the relationship, then there's several ways that you can do that. And one of those ways is by trying to learn about men and trying to understand men. Now, it sounds like an impossible task, <laughs> right, to try and understand what's going on in the mind of a man, but that's what we're here for today. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to look at just four things, four things that men want women to know. Four things that men want women to know. And so the first one is that lust is a struggle. Lust is a struggle. Now, I know that this is not just a male issue, all right? Uh, if you read the Bible, you know, you read the story of Pharaoh, um, Potiphar's wife who tried to chase down Joseph. So since the beginning of time, lust has been a male and a female issue. I think I saw, um, when I was doing research for this sermon, uh, I saw that 30% of women view pornography at least once a week. And once you go to once a month or, or uh, every so often, the numbers get even higher. So women, if this is something that you're struggling with, I don't want this to seem like it's just a male issue. And if you go to the next steps table in the back, there's different groups that we want to get you plugged into. Because like Jared said last week, this isn't something you can fight alone in the dark. So this is a male and a female issue. Uh, but today we're talking specifically about male uh, men. And so women, um, I, I want you to know, as, especially if you're in a relationship or if you're married, I'm not talking about someone else's husband or someone else's boyfriend. Or I'm talking about your boyfriend or your husband. Lust is a struggle. I haven't met a single person or a single male over the age 14 who, who doesn't struggle with this in some sort of fashion. And there's no age limit on it either. Um, there was the president of the Navigators was interviewing this 87-year-old missionary. And he asked him, he said, when was it that you finally gained victory over lust? And the man said, the 87-year-old missionary said, it hasn't happened yet. So this is something that uh, is prevailing in our culture. It, it, it affects every single man. It might not be at the top of their list of struggles, but, it, but it's up there. And our society isn't doing anything to help this issue, is it? I mean, uh, you know, things that are on TV, things that are even commercials now would have been considered pornographic years ago, right? And I mean, th- those of you guys who know, what was the top... Uh, top-selling movie in the box office this past weekend, right? This, this, these are things that point uh, to our culture's acceptance uh, of sexuality. And this isn't anything new. Uh, if you read the book of Corinthians, the church in Corinth that Paul was writing to, they were even worse, right? Sexuality wasn't just accepted, but it was uh, encouraged. Uh, it was part of, like, their pagan ritual services and, and just out in the open everywhere. So this isn't something new. And so the Bible talks about that, and every time the Bible talks about that, we don't have time to go into the specific verses, but it talks about how it, it should, sexuality and, and sex is only within the bounds of marriage. All right, now we're going to be talking about that a little bit more in upcoming weeks, so I just wanted to throw that out there so that you're not blindsided in a couple weeks when we're talking about it. Uh, but just because the Bible speaks towards that doesn't make it any easier, right? And so, men, I want to talk to you again. You need to know that this is your responsibility, all right, you can't blame women. You can't blame your wife. This is your responsibility. I love this quote from Every Man's Battle. Um, and it says, your purity must not depend on your mate's health or desire. God holds you responsible. Uh, the book of Proverbs says, a man who lacks self-control is like a city whose walls are broken down. All right? So this is, so men, you're held responsible for this. However, ladies, there are ways that you can help. All right, and so I want to give you just three of them. The first is by holding your man to a high standard. All right, none of that boys will be boys kind of stuff. Now, I know this might be difficult because some of you uh, have never had a a role model of what a man is supposed to be like, and so you see men who are stepping outside of what the Bible says, and you just think, oh, that's just normal, that's just what men do. Men just go to those kind of places, watch these kind of movies, look at that stuff on the Internet, that's just what men do. But I'm here to tell you this morning, that's not what men do. And so you should hold your your man to a high standard. The second thing, don't use sexuality as a way to manipulate men. (laughs) Now, I know that sounds kind of funny. Like when I say that, I think we kind of get the image of, you know, in the movies when people are driving along and there's a woman driving along speeding and the cop comes up and she just talks in a seductive voice and all that. That's not what I'm talking about. (laughs) 
Although I think that's kind of funny. <laughs> uh, I found this quote, and I just wanted to read this. Uh, it's from Dr. Willard Harley, who's a relationship specialist. And he says, he says that he's seen some of the most successful men in the world throw away everything for a sexual relationship. He says, and I think this is hilariously phrased, but it's true. He says, when in sexually exciting situations, men can actually lose their ability to see basic reason. Their misdirected sex drive has them completely unraveled. <laughs> so ladies, you know, with great power comes great responsibility there. <laughs> but, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about uh, manipula manipulating is, uh, you know, the whole, if you don't do what I like, then you're going to sleep on the couch tonight. That kind of thing. I know we joke around about that a lot, um, but the reality is in marriage, the bedroom isn't a privilege, it's a priority. All right, so that's important to remember. Uh, look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 5. He says, because sexual immorality is so common, each man should have his own wife, each woman should have her own husband. A husband should fulfill his marital responsibility to his wife, and likewise a wife to her husband. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. And a lot of people stop the verse right there, but it goes on. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but the wife does. So do not deprive one another sexually, except if you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, otherwise Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So what that means is like Paul, like Paul says in Romans 12, you should try, try, be trying to outdo each other uh, in, in love and in, and in grace. And then finally, uh, uh, lust, or I'm sorry, remember that modesty is important. Remember that modesty is important. I want to read one more quote from Dr. Sarah Sumner. Dr. Sarah Sumner, she's written many books on women and men in the church. And she says in her book, which is called Men and Women in the Church, surprisingly, uh, it says, I think it should be normal for people in the church to fight together for sexual purity. Most of the time, the subject is so taboo that we feel way too ashamed to admit our temptations, much less confess our sin. Thus, we isolate from each other rather than ministering to each other. We practically pretend like none of us has any live hormones. Consequently, many Christian men are rarely held accountable for the suggestive and demeaning things they say to Christian women, and women in the church are rarely held accountable for the way they dress. Most of us know that the issue of sex and modesty is a hypersensitive subject in the church. It's such a sensitive subject that people feel afraid to ask Christian women to cover themselves up. We're scared they'll think we're judging them in self-righteousness. We're scared they won't like us anymore or that they'll blame us and say it's our problem, not theirs. Now, I know that's kind of a long quote, uh, but this is a female uh, theologian. She, she writes books about men and women in the church. And she's saying that modesty is important. I think sometimes, especially if a man is up here stand, saying that, it's, it, it almost feels like it drifts off into legalism, right? That, um, you know, you can only wear your dress a certain length or you should only, you know, cover your shoulders or something like that. When I was in Israel with Amanda, we had to have certain modesty days where the women would have to cover their shoulders because we'd go to, like, some uh, place that there were a lot of people who would be offended if that wasn't the case. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not talking about specific rules, specific lengths of clothing, or anything like that. But what I'm saying is when you dress yourself, you should be dressing yourself to glorify God, not to bring attention to yourself. And in doing so, you'll help your brothers who also struggle with lust. Does that make sense? All right, so the first thing is that lust is a struggle. Now, we're kind of going to go a little bit faster through the other points, but we had to spend a little bit more time there because that's the most awkward one. No, just because it's the most difficult. Uh, the second thing is that friendship, friendship is vital. Now, if you're single here this morning, uh, last week's message and this week's message were primarily targeted at people who are in relationships. So if you have a goal to get married, or if you're you know, on the verge of getting married or in a relationship, I don't know how you would know that without being in a relationship, but if, if you're right on the, the doorstep, then this, this is for you as well. If you're single and you're not sure whether God's called you to marriage, we're going to be talking about that for the next two weeks. So, but this is still important because you need to know how to pray for your, your brothers and sisters who are in relationships, all right? So what I'm talking about this morning is friendship between two people who are in a relationship. Now, this might sound obvious. Like, of course, if you're going to be in a relationship, you want to be friends with them. But if you, look, if you think about it, all throughout history and even in a lot of places in the world today, marriage is when a man is completely dominating a woman. 
right? It's very um, misogynistic and, and patriarchal societies. But then in our culture today in Hollywood, it goes all the way, it swings all the way to the other side when relationships and marriage really have no substance at all, right? Two people just meet each other and suddenly they're in love. And there's no meaning to what that is. I was watching, uh, anyone seen, I'm, blank, I'm forgetting the name of the show, but I was watching some show that I had in mind to use an example and now I can't think of what it was. <laughs> but whatever. Uh, there's a show where, where this guy falls in love and, and he says, I love you, right after he meets the woman. How I Met Your Mother, thank you. <laughs> yes, How I Met Your Mother. So in, in shows like that and in Hollywood, people are falling just in and out of love, right? It's like they're changing lanes on the highway or something. That's how easy they fall in and out of love. Actually, I live in Dallas. I think it's harder to change lanes on the highway than it is for people to fall in and out of love on TV. <laughs> and so those relationships, they really have no substance at all. And so um, the Bible speaks to that. The Bible paints a completely different picture. And so you can turn there if you want. We're not going to really read the verse. But in Proverbs 2.17, Proverbs 2.17, the word that's translated as husband or companion, it's the word aleph, aleph, um, which is a, it's a unique word that means special confident or best friend, or best friend. And so your husband should be your best friend. He should be the one that you go to in times of need. Now I'm speaking, I think, a little bit now to the people who are newlyweds or the people who are younger in marriage. This means when you have to make a decision, you're not first going to your parents, your mom, your dad. You're not, they're not the first person that you're talking to. Your, your other friend um, from high school or one of your bridesmaids or anything like that. Your husband is the first person that you go to after the Lord, of course. The husband's the first person that you go to. That's why uh, it, it calls it the olive. It's the olive, your best friend. And so you see, men, um, this is just how we think. I know it's weird, but this is just how we think. If you're going to someone else before you go to your husband, then your husband starts to think that you don't trust them as much as you trust that other person. And so you remember last week when Jared said that uh, trust is, is the most important issue or the, the most important thing that a, a woman looks for in a man before like finances and, and physical attraction is trust. Trust is the most important thing. Well, in the same way, men want to feel trusted, and so if you don't go to them first, they're going to feel as if you don't trust them. And if they feel like you don't trust them, they feel like you don't respect them, which leads to uh, the third point, and that's that respect is imperative. Respect is imperative. Before I talk about respect, let me just back up one second. That's why it says in Genesis 2.24 that the man and wife left their mother and father, and father and are bound as one. That's the importance of that verse right there, right? Because... You're part of this family, and your parents are always still your parents. I try and call my parents at least once a week, if not more. And your siblings, if you have close relationship with your siblings, that's important. I try and talk to them at least once a week. There's six of them, so I can't talk to them all one day. <laughs> but I try, I try and talk to them at least all once a week. And so fam those relationships between your siblings, your family, um, your, your friends, those are all important. I'm not saying just neglect those. But your husband should be your best friend your special confidant, the one that you go to first. All right, and so the third point is that respect is imperative. Um, Dr. Emerson Egerich, it's a weird name, Egerich, it sounds like a waffle, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Dr. Emerson Egerich, the author of Love and Respect, I don't know where that came from, um, he says, in the middle of a conflict with my wife, so this is, this is a question that he asks men who are married, all right? He said, in the middle of a conflict with my wife or significant other, I am more likely to be feeling, A, that my wife or significant other doesn't respect me right now, or B, that my wife or significant other doesn't love me right now. And 81.5% of the men went with A. They said when they're in the middle of conflict, they feel like they're not respected. And so this might just seem kind of weird to some of you, but men and women are, because men and women are different, but what he's saying is that for most men, the need to feel respected during conflict is actually stronger than the need to feel loved. Now, it's interesting, if you remember when Bernard read those, those, um, the, the responses to the picture, that was the first one that was read. I know who said that in here, but I'm not going to call him out right now, but that was from our Hanley campus. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's true. Men need to feel respected almost more than they need to feel loved. And I think it's because deep down, when you're in the middle of a conflict, a husband knows that his wife loves him right? His, his husband knows that he's loved by his wife. 
But when in the middle of conflict, um, they're not always quite sure if they're respected by their wife. And so the Bible speaks to this. In Ephesians 5.33, it says, to sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself. Remember, that was all last week. The husband's to love his wife as himself. And the wife is to respect her husband. Now, I'm not crazy enough to think that any husband's perfect. I know myself. If I was married to myself, I'd probably lost respect for myself a long time ago. That's just how it goes. I'm kind of a humiliating confession to make here. Uh, Amanda, I asked if I could share this earlier. We were driving, and if you don't know my wife, she's 30 weeks pregnant. And so we were driving when she was in her first trimester, and she was talking about how she wasn't feeling good. And I made a crucial mistake that husbands, take notes, never say this to your wife when she's pregnant. I said, are you sure it's that bad? Uh, that's bad. I hear the booze, but it gets worse. It gets worse. I said, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I want to share this. <laughs> I, I said, it didn't seem that bad when my mom was pregnant. <laughs> oh, yeah, there, there it is. Yeah, see, I see the jaws dropping right there. <laughs> So the reason I'm saying that is, is, ladies, I understand that it's difficult to live with a man. <laughs> we, we say things before we think about them a lot of times. That's just how it goes. And so you might be thinking, I want to respect my husband, but he's, he's just crazy. He, he, does think, he's, he, he doesn't do things that I think are deserving of my respect. And so that's why I want to point out what's important to understand is that God's command for wives to respect their husband here, it's not conditional. Right? It doesn't say... If husbands love their wives, then you respect them. In the same way for men, it doesn't say if your wife respects you, then you should love your wife. Right? Those are not conditional statements. They're imperatives or they're commands. And so just a couple examples here. You know, as women and men, all of us, our goal should be to live, to model after the way that Christ and that God leads, right? And so if you look in the Bible at how God always deals with men, he deals with them in a respectful manner even if they don't deserve it, all right? So Abraham, he was kind of a coward, right? He took his sister in, uh, into the land, or no, he took his wife into the land, but he said, call them, or call her my sister, because he was scared that they were going to kill him. But what does God do? God changes his name to Abraham, which means father of many nations, uh, which was a sign of huge respect back then. He dealt with, uh, dealt with Abraham in a respectful way, even though Abraham might not have deserved it. Or Gideon. Gideon was kind of uh, always questioning the Lord, asking for more proof from God, uh, hiding from God, uh, and God called him a man of mighty valor. Right? He dealt with him in a respectful way. Or one more, uh, Simon Peter in the New Testament. Peter was always asking all kinds of stupid questions. If Peter had a car and was driving around with his wife, he might have said that exact same thing that I said. Uh, but what does God do? God, call, God changes his name to Peter, which means rock. He, he, he treats him with respect. And so, ladies, I'm not saying, you know, just let your husband just walk all over you, just be a doormat. That's not what I'm saying at all. Remember what I said, the Bible is not mis misogynistic. That verse especially, respect your husbands, it's been misused in the past. But what it's saying is just don't, um, you know, don't deal with your husband in a demeaning sort of way. I'm not sure if you knew this, uh, but a lot of men, if we're completely honest with ourselves, are actually insecure. All right? 75% of men admitted to feeling like they're an imposter. And so many men spend their lives with these voices that are constantly telling them, you're not good enough. Or it's, it's only a matter of time until people find out that, you're, that you don't deserve to be where you're at. And so you would think that the home should be the place where those voices are silenced, right? But in a lot of homes, those voices are amp actually amplified and get louder. And so uh, I think a lot of, a lot of ladies think that... Um, you know, saying, saying things to your, your husband that are insulting might motivate them to change, uh, but it doesn't work like that, right? If you're constantly demeaning your husband, uh, eventually they're just going to shut down. They might get angry, um, but it'll lead to a man who's disconnected, bitter, and unemotional. That's why Proverbs 21.9, and this is kind of a harsh verse, but it's in the Bible, it says it's better to live on the corner of a roof than to share a house with a nagging wife. <laughs> uh, when I was putting this in, uh, showing Jess the slides up there, 
uh, she's like, where did you get this quote from? Because <laughs> it seems, it seems kind of harsh, but that's in the Bible. And it's so important in the Bible that the Bible actually repeats it twice. It says it in Proverbs 25, 24, just a few chapters later, the exact same thing, which God is basically saying, you know, go up to the corner of your roof. That's a better place for you to live than inside where there's like plumbing and all that. And so it's, it, but it's true. Um, so, so ladies, just don't tear down, don't tear down your husbands, especially in public, especially in public. So uh, lust is a struggle. Friendship, and I might even add best friendship, is vital. Um, respect is imperative. And then finally, grace and forgiveness are essential. Grace and forgiveness are essential. Uh, the Chicago Sun-Times, they surveyed 2,300 couples, 2,300 couples. And of those 2,300 couples, or they asked them all this question. They said, if you could remarry your spouse today, would you do it? And of those 2,300 couples, 1,800 of the men said yes. Now, that's kind of, I mean, it's kind of sad because it should be 100%, but that's 81%. Um, which I guess is a little bit better than you might think. Um, but of the women, the same woman, it was the same couples, of those women, less than half said yes. Less than half of them said yes. And so um, also, over the past 10 years, 80% of divorces were filed by women. It's also usually the woman who seeks out marriage counseling in the majority of the times. It doesn't mean all the time, but in the majority of the time. And uh, women always seem to have their, um, often seem to be the most disappointed in the relationship. And so if that's you today, if you're a woman who's here that's just dissatisfied with the relationship that you're in, know you're in, good, you're in, you're in the majority. All right, so don't feel terrible about yourself. Don't, don't be sitting here thinking, you know, I'm going to just condemn you right now for that. And again, we have groups. That's the reason we have groups, because issues like marriage, um, you know, any kind of struggles, you can't deal with those by, by yourself, right? You need community, and so that's the importance of groups, and so I'd highly recommend, if you're not plugged into a group, uh, to go back to the table at the end of the service there, and we can, we can help get you plugged in. Uh, but a, a huge reason why a lot of women are dissatisfied in a relationship is because of the men. Now, if you weren't here last week, men, you need to go back and listen to Jared's sermon from last week, because men, we've dropped the ball on a lot of issues in society. All right, so a huge reason for that disappointment is because of the men. However, a lot, another reason is because a lot of women are putting unrealistic expectations on their husbands. Now remember, I said don't lower your standards, don't lower the bar. But you have to realize that your husband is not going to meet up to that bar all the time. All right? Uh, I have a quote here from Ruth Bell, uh, Ruth, Graham, Ruth Bell Graham, uh, Billy Graham's late wife. And she said, it is, it is a foolish woman who expects her husband to be to her that which only Jesus Christ himself can be. Always ready to forgive, totally understanding, unending patience, invariably tender and loving, unfailing in every area, anticipating every need, and making more than adequate provision. Such expectations put a man under an impossible strain. See, only Jesus can truly satisfy. Right? And I think a lot of women are looking for in their husbands for that which only Jesus can ultimately satisfy. And so my question to you this morning is, have you found your full satisfaction in Christ alone? Because he's the only one that can be that ultimate fulfillment. And if you have, then that means grace and forgiveness should just be overflowing from you. Right? How, how can we as Christians who really experience the depths and the riches of Christ's love and mercy not be forgiving? We should be the, the ones that are dishing out forgiveness left and right because we've been forgiven. So, lust is a struggle. Uh, um, friendship is vital. Respect is imperative. And grace and forgiveness are essential. So where do we go with that? What do we do to try and, try and wrap this up? Those are four things that men want women to know. So where do you go from here? Well, what I want to do is I just want to give three quick points of application. Three ways that you can apply this um, into your lives. All right, the first is to talk to your husband. Now, it might sound obvious. Um, I, I, was, I saw something online, you might have seen it, about a, a man and a woman uh, who are married, a husband and a wife, who haven't even spoken to each other in like 18 years. 
which that's just mind-blowing, but that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> what I'm getting at is actually talk to your husband about ways in which you can be a better wife. All right, and this goes for men, too. Men, you need to talk to your wife about what areas that you're lacking in. It might be kind of an awkward conversation at first, but this should be something that's going on on a regular basis. How am I failing to meet your expectations, and what can I do to make that up? All right, the second is to talk to the Lord. See, things that happen outwardly can only happen if there's an inward change. And so it's important that you're praying regularly. Uh, you, you know, many of you women, women might be here that want to respect your husband, but he's failed you over and over and over again. And it's not your job to be the Holy Spirit for your husband and to change him in that way, but you should be praying that the Lord would work within his heart as well that he'll change. So talk to the Lord. And finally, pray together. Pray together. Listen, if you're in a relationship, if you're married, if you're newlywed, been married for years and years, whatever the case might be, if you're not praying with your wife, if you're not praying with your husband, then you're asking for disaster, right? I mean, it's, it's an old saying, but the couple that, that prays together stays together. That's, a, that's, that's true, all right? And so those are three things that you can do um, to, to move towards the direction that God wants you to live in within marriages. All right, so let's, uh, let, let's wrap this up by, by kind of landing this plane here where we started. And that's that the Bible is not um, misogynistic. It's been misused. But you see, if people from outside, if people from outside the church look in the church and see us living the way that God wants us to live, if husbands are leading in their families with self-sacrificial leadership and wives are respecting their husbands, then families and marriage, marriages are going to flourish, right? They're going to be strong. And people from outside the church won't look in the church and say, oh, that's so restrictive or that's so domineering. I don't want anything to do with that. But they're going to look in the church and say, tell me how to get my marriage like that. I want my family like that. Now, people, people will come to you and they'll say, uh, how, how is it that, that you get along so well with your husband? How are, these, uh, how, how are your kids growing up with great role models? Can you tell me more about that? And that'll be a perfect opportunity to point them to this book. Because sometimes it's hard to share the gospel if we're not living the gospel, right? Uh, John, uh, I think it was John Wesley. John Wesley, uh, he, he had a quote. He was, he was in England, and, and he said, give me 100 men and women who hate sin and love God, and I will shake England for God. That's what he said. Now imagine how we can multiply that here in Hanley if we had 50 or 100 marriages that were just completely on fire for God, what, what kind of impact would that make in the community? How many people could we bring through the doors based on our example that we're setting out for other people? All right, so in just a second, Will and the worship team are going to come back up and, and they're going to lead us in a final song. But I want us to do something very specific this, this, uh, this morning. I want us to be intentional about this. If you're married, no matter if you've never prayed with your husband or your wife before, it might be weird at first, but I want at the beginning of this song, I want husbands and wives to pray together. You can pray in the pew, you can come up here, you can move around wherever you want. If you're not married, and you'd like to be married, I want you to pray that God will send someone into your life um, and prepare the hearts of both you and the person that he's going to bring into your life uh, so that you can have a, a marriage that's glorifying to him. And third, if you're not married, and you're not sure if that's what God has called for your life, then I still want you to pray. I want you to pray for all the couples within this, within these walls, in this church, that their marriages uh, will point towards God. Because if we want to get people uh, in the doors, we're going to have to start living like it. But it all starts, starts in the home. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you that your word isn't always easy to digest, that there's challenging things we have to work through. Because if we understood everything that there was, was to understand about you, then we'd be God, and we're not. And so we thank you for that. We thank you that uh, there's things we have to wrestle with. And so I pray specifically this morning for all the marriages in here, for all the husbands, that like we talked about last week, that the husbands will lead within their families uh, with self-sacrificial leadership, that they'd be trustworthy, and I pray for the wives 
I pray that you will help them respect their husbands. That they will do what's most glorifying to you. And that ultimately all the marriages within this church will point people towards you. God, bless this time of prayer and and singing. It's in your name that we pray. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.